When this all happened, I had no idea what treaty was. None of us did. It was scary because we didn't know what the end result would be, but we knew we had to take over or we would still be the same way. For me, it was as a mother, as a woman, looking at the future of our generations, our families. There's always been a traditional generational ownership of land. This will put it on paper. We're all here moving forward. Now we have a say. Everything that we have went through or everything we've gone through, it was just, you're a small piece to an enormous puzzle that just fits. When you become a treaty nation, when you sign that document, we're a self-governing nation. They don't tell us what to do anymore. It's important for our younger generation to know about the beginning and the end of our treaty. There was times when none of us knew that the community would be there next year. Now there's no question. Morning, everyone. I was up here before, and we started discussions um, on our constitution. You guys remember that? I started with treaty when I was 18, 19, and started drawing the maps and stuff like that. I was uh, 21 when I first got elected. I was young. From the beginning, when we signed our treaty, I was one of the signers. I'm, I'm very honored to have been a part of that, to be a part of history. And that's what it is, it's history. Back then we had all the food that we needed. It was all from the ocean, from the lands around us. Our food was right down the beach. We took clams down there. We could go fishing right by the beach here and catch salmon. We had canoes. Our fathers and grandfathers built it. They let us use to go wherever we want. Up across to the rivers. We'd go across there and do some trout fishing, hunting. Things were in abundance back then. Villages were located by the water because our people were dependent on, on the fishery. When I think back to my childhood, I, I remember that we were very uh, community-minded. We really looked out for each other. We used to always say that the community raised the children because we looked out for each other. We need to start teaching our people our ways because they're so important. And the way they taught it was not with violence, not with harsh words. And you were never degraded. No one was ever degraded or put down. A child was treated as very precious and an angel. You know? And we need to get back to that. I recall lots of the experience of a residential school. It was very successful in what it was trying to do in separating the child from their parents, separating the child from their culture and their language. Very successful in that. Very successful in uh, trying to make us understand the the way they wanted us to fit into mainstream Canada by beating us or strapping us if we were caught speaking our own tongue. That's what I remember of my childhood. I spent 14 years in the 
Alberni Indian Residential School. So it was a long period of time. Trauma is unresolved grief. And grief is a loss of not just a life, but a loss of your land, a loss of your culture, a loss of basically a lot of human rights that has to be worked out. It's a lot of grief for a person. Lately, I've been feeling it a lot. <laughs> I know that when I left residential school, I was nobody and I was nothing. I walked with my head down. I didn't look anybody in the eyes. I couldn't even order a hamburger for myself. Now, these kids are growing up without that influence in their life, but the influence is coming from somewhere else. And hopefully we'll be able to teach them a bit more about our ways. And because we're starting this, they can integrate that into a new government and hopefully the people that are involved in the future, hopefully they'll be honest. Our treaty gives us a lot of our rights back, not all of it, but some of it. We can fight for the rest because of our treaty. And our goal is to get you guys to, to be a part of that one day. So it's, it's all about you guys and, and, and the generations after that. See, the treaty had started with the whole 15 nations of New Channels in the beginning, and that was in about, I think, 1996. And it had gone for about four years, and, and, but was not really going anywhere. 28 years ago, you can imagine 14 nations collectively trying to get all of our ducks together, or ducks in a row, or ducks in a V, whatever you want to call it, uh, to negotiate in detail every single item. Governance, ha ho, the true meaning of interconnectedness, the lands, the sea, the resources, the people, the responsibilities, the NAS given responsibility to look after everything within the ha ho. Some of the nations had amazing orators, Stanley Sam, George Watts, and on and on. There was a, a litany of elders and, and orators within the nations at the time. We found a chief negotiator the late George Watts, who was a big part of our big treaty table as new child, and Vic Pearson, who was also part of that table. It was quite a process, a lot of this. George was a, a table pounder, and they would walk in with George and sit down at the table, and they had no idea if George was gonna get up and walk out, um, pound the table, or just start um, talking. <laughs> George Watts was kind of hurting us all along and being very gifted in speaking and negotiating, he uh, held the Canada and BC to account. So that really was one of the keys to how we got to the agreement in principle. What surprised many of us, and me more than most perhaps, was that only half of the nations decided to approve the agreement in principle. A lot of it was turned down, you know, especially a lot of the bigger nations. They just said, no, it's costing too much. It's not going anywhere. We don't want it. But the, those who did choose to go ahead were the ones that formed Manos. So we ended up with five nations who collectively renamed themselves the Manos. And that's how we got there. The legal name is First Nations of the Monolith Treaty Society, made up of Cayuca Chaklaset, Tukwat, Ukulathat, Ho Chaklaset, and Uhayat. A powerful group. And again, George Watts was at the helm, and that was a real blessing for all of us. We learned a lot. He guided the process very uh, efficiently, I believe, towards the goal. But along the way, he passed away. So when George Watts passed away, right when we were negotiating, that was a real hard hit for us. We didn't stop, you know. We, we knew we had to keep going, even if it was for him, you know, to honor him. 
and we did lose elders during the process. And I always wish that they were here when we were celebrating. A man named Gary Yabsley, again very gifted, very smart. He was around when Section 35 was negotiated to be part of the Constitution of Canada. And he became our new chief negotiator. And we picked up our pieces and this was the most powerful thing I've ever seen in my life. People who never said a word at our negotiating table from our mono First Nations stood up and said the most amazing things in the most amazing and powerful ways, without exception. We all had the fire in our belly. We all wanted to be the one to get up and speak, but we had to speak as one voice. And when you're a collective of negotiating nations, that has a strength. The province gave in. They basically said, we're now willing to acknowledge that self-government requires a full suite of authorities. And we made it to a final treaty. And it gives me chills even thinking about it. We had a final agreement ready, which was uh, voted on and put in place with a high percentage vote of yes within our five communities. So we've had a treaty since 2011. It was amazing just to see everyone come together and it was that midnight when we signed, we went to the back and we burned, the, we burned INAC and it was just an amazing experience just to be part of that. Just to see the release, you know, off of our shoulders and just, just understanding that this is, this is a real thing. For me, I cried. <laughs> I just cried. I, I couldn't stop crying when I um, when we signed. I was just more in awe or surprised that uh, we did it. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> long, long process, long, long days, long weeks, and long years. Seemed like to sign my name on the Monterey Treaty was an awesome thing because I know that it was led by us. We led it by ourselves. When we signed the treaty, you know, it was a big celebration. It was a, you know, we felt that uh, we came a long way and, but then the work just began. I think it took a while for our citizens to kind of catch up to where we were at in terms of when we signed the treaty. We understood the efforts of getting there and then the then challenge became of implementing it. It took time. I believe it really took time because uh, at times like it was mixed emotions. It was difficult because we'd been in uh, Nuchaunot for many, 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 many years. It was a real big change for, for many of us, especially the elders really was a big change. I have to question it and wonder what this change is all about. Is it better for our community? Is it better for our families? Is it better for our children, our grandchildren? I guess there was a perception that life was going to go on the same, but uh, uh, the little changes or the big changes that we made, uh, people were uh, upset, I guess, really. This is where I'm going to get real honest. <laughs> I remember being frustrated because we were constantly told this was going to be good for our future generations. It's going to be good for our people. But again, I had no idea what that meant. I don't know that uh, a number of us were had a full understanding of what it was going to be like going into treaty, but we certainly do now. A big part of it was understanding our role as a self-governing nation. It is still something that's taking time, understanding that we're no longer a band of Indians and getting that language clear with everybody. It seems to be doing good. We've got all this stuff happening with our tribe and, and it seems to be running smoothly and I guess as any operation would run smoothly. They're gonna have some opposition, they always do. Are we better off to the extent that it's balanced from where we were? No, we're not there yet, but we can gradually get there. And that's what I look at treaty, gradually getting us there. 
probably going to take us, who knows, decades, probably decades. Because you're dealing with people that, that aren't willing to change what they've seen, what they thought was right, but for us was a totally wrong thing to do. From being better off when we entered a treaty, I, I, can always, I can always say something. From a financial position, for example, it's good to be many times better off than we were when we entered a treaty. And, and I'm, I'm really, really, really happy about that. The first five years was a learning process about putting our laws in place, implementing them, learning how to do the, you know, how to work the government. And the past five years has been full speed ahead. When we were on Dryanac, we couldn't do anything. We had to fight for our housing, we had to fight for all of our infrastructure, our water, electricity, all of that kind of stuff, you know, it was all, all new. When I was young, we, we didn't have any of that at all. We've come a long, long, long way from where we were under INAC and having to fight for stuff. You can see through the trees there is another one of the new houses. We did six new houses last year and we're doing another at eight additional houses this year. So we've done multiple engagements with the citizens over the years and one of the biggest things that people keep continuing to saying is they want to they want to go home, they want to go home and so this is a project that we've undertaken to, uh, to try to get the citizens home. The Minuth Treaty allows for individuals to see the the opportunity within their lands and have control over what they do in their lands more so than they would have in the pre-treaty days. Historically in the INAC days there was traditional and cultural sense of ownership of the land but there was no opportunity to realize the value of the land in the sense that there was no true title or ownership from a, a lawmaking perspective. Now citizens can have the opportunity to apply for and gain uh, ownership that can realize the value through mortgaging or, or creating growth on their lands. The majority of the citizens that are getting houses have, have voiced pleasure and, and appreciation for the works that are happening and be able to return home. You can see some of the we've put up in the last year and you can see them prepping for new foundations for new houses uh, moving forward. We've got one house here and then there'll be, you can see the prep for uh, three more houses along the waterfront and then there'll be two houses there and one more house up on the hill over there. Some of the meetings we've had with citizens in regard to housing in the village, one of the biggest things is they say one they want to return home. And so this is an opportunity for those people and some of the citizens to return home and hopefully future phases of housing initiatives, whether they be townhouses or single family homes, while well, other people who may not have lived here, but their parents or their grandparents did to have an opportunity to spend time in their in their where they grew up or where their where their ancestors spent time. We have the opportunity to look at what contractors are, would be best for the position, who have experience working in remote locations, do good quality work, and we can have the opportunity to build relationships with those companies so we can build stuff designed for the land that will last long rather than just putting something on the ground and walking away from it because they have no real connection to it. Being able to uh, control what happens on the nation's lands and uh, be able to say exactly what you want and when you want it versus being at the whim and the funding of the federal government. I believe it's a benefit of an altruity, yes. I'll be really on my grandkids this summer because I'm home now. <laughs> I'll be there and I'll be getting back into it. It's gonna be wonderful. And that's what the, what's what the government has done for us right now, is bringing us back home and back to our ways and back to our teachings. And, I'll do the best I can to help my grandkids and great grandkids. Yeah, they're so wonderful. <laughs> the fact that you own land now, that it's your land, investors look at you differently now. When we deal with private sector, there's a stronger comfort zone that we're there to utilize the tools of the treaty. And we're there because we're no longer a confrontational group. Well, we, we settled our differences with Canada and here's how we want to move forward now. 
And I sit there very comfortably saying, I know I, I got the land that I need to, if I want to expand, if I want to develop. You know, that, that's something because people are, are no outside world now. That's a good place to invest. Where before we didn't, we weren't considered a good place to invest because we had too many obstacles in our way. But now that we got treaty, this is our land. That's a huge advantage, you know, being self-governing, being able to make your own laws and rules on, on your land, manage it how you see fit. Can't beat that. We've been working with Western Forest Products with a training program where, you know, we're somewhere people are going to be trained and make a start making half decent wages and you know we we're, we're pouring a lot into education we are getting into more of a management kind of thinking you know i could think of a couple where we've uh, increased our riparian zones around creeks and rivers and uh, setbacks you know another thing that we've done is exceeded our provincial standards is plant trees within the first year of, of logging whereas the provincial standard is two years Another thing we've done is a stumpage and the selling of our timber. We've committed $5 a meter to, to go to our fisheries enhancement program. So, you know, we, you know that's two three $300,000 a year that our fish enhancement uh, team is getting from the forest company. You know, we're making the treaty what we want it to be. If there is a certain way that we want to manage the forest within our treaty land, this is how we want to manage it. What enabled us to be working with Western, for example, is that they also wanted something that we had. Right? I, I see it exactly that way, that you, know, you now have the ability to make it what you want it to be. And what I want it to be one day is that Hoeit one day will be able to say that, that we have 100% say in how our territory is managed. You know, I, I thought I'd never see the day that, you know, we'd, we'd get to this point, you know, in my lifetime anyway. But I'm glad we did. I found it a really sad day for me when um, we first started negotiating land and my father was sitting there with the, uh, with the government um, people and asking for land back that was his. And, and he, he always maintained to the government, this is my land, like he'd, he'd get angry sometime because they would say, in our hearts, our, to our traditional territory is our land and uh, it always will be. The, one of the biggest problems of the, First Nations have today is that they've been segregated from the rest of Canada and, and under a different, you know, law, like that should never have happened. To go to the government to ask for something back was not a great feeling. Like I, it was sad for me to watch my father go through that, but we did it. We only had, it was like 596 acres of so-called reservation land. So out of this process, we now own approximately 1,500 hectares of land. And we've also purchased a large tract of land that was called private lands. It was owned by a logging company when they downsized. And these logging companies became owners of a lot of our land. We weren't able to get that land back through negotiation. Any private land was kind of off the, you know, off the, negotiation. So we negotiated to have um, put in there that if it was ever to go for sale that we would have first first rights to that and it happened this year. <laughs> we have our land. So now we are in government. You know I feel good about that and that was our, our goal. Young oh, hey. Young oh, young oh, young oh, he, uh, young oh, he, uh, young oh, hey, young oh, hey, young oh, hey, young oh, hey. This drum I'm holding belongs to our grandfather, Cecil Mack. The song we just sang called the Victory Song, which is talking about getting a whale. The whales were what carried our people, that fed us, and so this song he gave to the people, any, anyone who was having a victory of any kind, he gave them permission to sing this song, and um, we're, we're very proud of that, to um, be the owners of that song.
coming into a treaty with having to create and make all these new laws was, was something something new to me. Uh, it was a lot to take, take on, but we're, we're there, we're doing it. Since treaty, uh, we've been able to build our water plants suitable for over 300 homes. Uh, we've got a wastewater plant, same thing, 300 homes. We've uh, brought in the high-speed internet, and uh, BC Hydro's come in and we've powered up all of our community plus enough lots in Makoa for another 20 or so out of home. So we are here at Seeker Beach Campground. It's doing business for Toquat Marina and Campground. Uh, this campground site here is uh, 72 sites. I manage one of our forestry companies, Toquat Forestry. We contract out and tender out packages of timber for timber sales and we have a dry land sorted up the road. We have a wood lot and we have a, a sawmill to help kind of generate, manufacture products uh, from our forest tenure. That was one of the advantages like treaty, signing a treaty is, is giving us the land to do as we want. The land is ours now, so there's no more asking, it's uh, just doing. We used to have a generator when we first uh, rebuilt here. Um, we moved to BC Hydro, hydro poles have come in. Now we've uh, got cleaner energy, wastewater treatment, as well as a water treatment plants for the community. And um, we will be having more homes built in this area, as well as another lodge for guests. It's been a great experience to watch our community rebuild. My daughter um, explaining treaty really is, I mean, this land is yours. I mean, that's, that's the biggest, biggest thing I can, I can tell her. I mean, it wasn't before, it was borrowed land. Um, today, the land you walk on is, is yours to, to have, a, have a say in. We have 5,500 hectares now that we have jurisdiction over and I mean, the ability to move forward and develop on, uh, on those lands. Yeah. It might not be as much as, I mean, that we've uh, historically had over the past, but I mean, now we have, I mean, defined rights over those uh, territories. Uh, that, and that's, I think for us is uh, uh, a good thing to, to move forward and, and uh, be able to develop in the future and the future of our children. Within uh, the peninsula here of uh, Euclid, we're one of the biggest landowners. So, I mean, there's potential for development. And what that development looks like, I mean, will be governed by the, the citizens and, uh, and um, where we want to go for that. So there's a lot of room for entrepreneurs to, to move, uh, move forward. When citizens evolve into this new governance that we do have will be the, their ability to change the things that don't work and the ability to change the things that might work. We've transitioned into, I mean, trying to take back our health care. Uh, that, that's a thing that we probably would never ever be able to do under the, the INAC system. Now we can be in charge of our own health care and what really matters to us. Our children, our language, you know, developing a language law that will be coming into effect. I mean, once, once things are done for the first time, I mean, now it, it, it is who we are as youth Lutha. We currently have two language classes going. It's the most uh, amount of students I've seen in a really long time. So it's really exciting to see all the new learners. When I started learning, I was about 28 years old and I didn't have much of a passion or drive for anything. But when I started going to classes with my grandma, I got to learn with her for two years. It just sparked something inside of me and the passion that I was looking for. So definitely a sense of belonging back to the, back to the community here. My grandmother's last words to me were, be proud of who you are and where you come from, and language and culture is, is what that is. Long-term desire has always been to bring people home, but with that you have to have jobs and housing and the ability to provide education and cultural supports to the citizens, so I think we're getting there. In an ideal world, we'd be 100% uh, citizen employed. The support is there, it's just up to the citizen to reach out and take that next step on their own and develop and complete their own goals.
after treaty, we all of a sudden are owners of our own lands and our resources. And so because of that, we're able to move forward and make decisions easily through our government and with the people and finally start moving forward and utilizing our resources so that we can create money for the nation. They always said there's power in water. There's power in water. It has a spirit. That's what I was taught when I was very young by my grandmothers. Everything was a cycle. The water went into the trees, came out of the trees, went back into the forest and ran into the rivers and ran in the oceans. And it was life throughout, and that's what I was taught. The water was very important to our people, and it's, it's frightening to watch the water change. If it stops, we'll stop. Our most valuable asset is water that we received in treaty. We received uh, 50 cubic decameters of water. At this point, uh, we have six water licenses. Each are worth millions, and if we chose to, we could extract a million gallons of water a day out of each of those. Welcome to Nucci. This is one of our current projects that we're working on, Thunderbird Spirit Water. We will have a retail store location at the Thunderbird Building. The water is sourced from natural spring location within the traditional territory of the Uchuklisut tribe. In the treaty, we had rights for that water, and so now we're finally utilizing it and creating that money for the nation. Once the water plant gets going, year two or three, it'll be completely paying for itself, and then creating a huge economic development. Another venture we're working on as well is with Cascadia Seaweed uh, with kelp farms out in Barclay Sound, and that will be sold to markets around the world. One of the big projects we're undergoing at the moment is revitalization of uh, the traditional ancestral village in the Chuckleset Tribe territory. Uh, we currently have six new houses that have been built and are projected to build eight more this year and that will fulfill all the old ancestral properties. For me, it's going to be awesome, and I dearly look forward to that, because a lot of our people want to move back. The reasons they moved away was because of uh, either education, health, jobs, and we're trying to address those issues. Right now, because of all of the commercial rec tenures that opened up and um, all of these aquaculture um, businesses happening down the canal, there's more opportunity there to run your own businesses and create partnerships and make a living down there. If you really have the drive, you can make it work. What we really need is for our people to get educated. With the increased revenue, we are able to hire more people. And with the increased responsibility, we have to hire more people. And so the preference is always that we're going to be hiring our own people, but we need people that are educated to take on those jobs. As soon as he saw the houses, he's like, when can I get started? Because <laughs> they're oh, pretty... Yeah. Uh, he's Shelter Bay Construction, so he's in the valley. We're constantly educating people what it means to be a self-governing nation. We're educating our people, we're educating people at a municipal, regional, district level, at a provincial level, uh, people working for Canada. We're educating them what it means to be a self-governing nation. The treaty is clear about um, having the ability to develop your own laws. And the laws developed are based on traditional law. So the very fact that we're a self-governing indigenous government, that's what's the key here. We forget that. For the longest time we were on the sidelines, we had no say. But now that we're um, self-governing, we, we can make our own decisions around that now and build relationships based on how we want them to be formed, not, not formed from how federal or provincial government wants us to. It's a really good thing for us. It works for us. 
I've said it multiple times, this has been the best job that I've had. I have been able to speak on behalf of my community and on behalf of my nation in a meaningful way to me. I never ever expected to be here. I never sat there and thought, you know, where we're going into treaty, I should be a part of this. My grandmother's the one that pushed me into it, that I could do something like this. And I never thought in my life I would ever go to Ottawa and speak to the uh, deputy ministers and not just speak, but have them actually listen. The amount of pride is, is huge. Um, I mean, we get to be the voice for our, for our members. You can't make everyone happy, but you know, you, you, still, you still keep going. One thing you have to do is rearrange your furniture up here and love your job. A lot of people look at us and say, this is boring, you know, and then they talk about, it's like watching paint dry on a wall. Not me. When someone wants to leave a really important post, I encourage them to stay. Learn all you can about it. Knowledge is power. A good negotiator has to be able to talk um, to the elders, to the youth, um, to members, and get their story. So part of the negotiation involves to get their story, to get their understanding, what they see um, that this thing called treaty, how it will benefit them. You have to be able to tell the story so that the Canada gets it and BC gets it. The story is there first and foremost. You've got to make sure you get it across to the other side. You've got to have that heart-to-heart -heart moment. Any step we make moving forward internally as a nation, we seek the guidance of our people first. We're here on behalf of our people. For me, my job is knowing who and what you represent wherever you sit. The boss is the people. Some of us need to pass the torch. The young people need to, to be educated. They need to understand what this thing called treaty is. This is a start, you know, we're, we're 10 years in. We've learned quite a bit and we're still learning. Now, there's so much within our nation, within the administration, within the governance, and you know, there, there's so much that you guys can, can do. We're getting there. I never thought in my previous career that we would ever get to where we are today. And I, I believe we're just starting on the path to true reconciliation, and mutual respect and understanding. And a richer, a richer life for all. I hope that all of the nation's businesses are successful and they create jobs for many of the members and I would like to see a whole community grow all out into the canal and out into the Barclay Sound. We're reliant on Fourth Street now and we're trying to get away from that, you know, not have the ups and downs of the resource industry. We're hoping to try to uh, focus on other industries where, where, the, where, the, where the business is more stable year round rather than ups and downs, peaks and valleys you know, how to, how to encourage our people to move back home. And that's what was one of our goals. I'm always hopeful for the future. I'm actually excited for the future. Um, I have been quite excited uh, with the development that we've done in the last four years, especially in getting our infrastructure. That's the core. It's the least exciting for people because it's all in the ground and nobody sees it. It's out of sight, out of mind. And as long as things are functioning in your house, you don't, you don't worry about it. But the goal is to make sure nobody worries about it and that we have an opportunity to expand, right? It's going to be very important that we expand our community. You know, the future, to me, it's bright. The economic opportunities are there. The problem is human beings, and it's, and it's not an Indigenous thing, it's a human being thing, is that we want it now. But you've got to put the hard work into it. Yeah, there's going to be opportunities. Yes, there's going to be full-time employment. We have a lot of um, harvestable resources um, at the doorstep. It's there for the taking. Keeping in mind um, that you've got to make sure that you have conservation values. You know, the big thing is just um, 
uh, empowering people to say, these are our lands, these are our resources, this is our government, this is our treaty. Well, I would like to really see a community like, you know, our own services, education, employment, right at, within Toquat lands. That's what I'd like to see. With all our nation, with our nation from our tribe, we're going to do really well in teaching our younger generation to be helpful in where our young people need to be. And I really believe it's going there. Because when I hear the young people talking, it makes me happy. One of the big responsibilities is to educate the next generation. And we want to ensure that we, we continue to have strong leadership and strong leadership from grassroots strong leadership from our cultural views, strong leadership that have a strong educational background. So we try and, and make sure that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren passing the knowledge and the wisdom on of our traditional teachings is really important to me today. I think we need to work with the younger people. Us old guys are so set in what we're doing, what we did before. But the younger people are the ones that are going to have to do all the work pretty soon. And we need to get those younger people more involved with what the council is doing. I am definitely motivated by the fact that, you know, we do have the generations that are, that are wanting to be a part of it. They're curious. There are members of our legislature that are talking to them and and stirring up that interest and so I'm excited that Generation is going to be taking over the roles that we have right now. The thing that drives me is to, to try to work for a better future for my grandchildren, basically. If I do that, uh, I've improved the lives of all the white children, I guess, because that's my main, my, my main driver of all the years I've been with Hawaii to improve the lives of white children. The one thing that grounds me is looking into my son's eyes. You know, I could have the worst day ever. And just looking into his eyes and just seeing, I'm doing this for, for him. I'm doing this for, for all of his cousins and all of his, all, of it, all of his relatives, all of his uncles, his aunties. That's, that's definitely it right there. As a member of a treaty nation, I would say to the youth um, that anything's possible. You can do whatever you wish. You don't have to stick to one job. You can branch out and be an entrepreneur and do a few different jobs. You can live wherever you'd like to live. It's a lot of opportunity, and I, I don't think it's going to go away in, in the near future. Trades, so whether, whether you're building, whether you're a plumber, whether you're an electrician, now I think you have to be uh, the ability to change with the times. And, and don't just sit and wait for things to change. You gotta go out and, I mean, change uh, what you wanna do too, right? I mean, that, that's my view. I mean, I always encourage my kids to, to do something what, what they want and, and rather than uh, what they think they can't do. We're trying to help ourselves now. In the end, I know it will, it'll work. I really want it to happen in my generation and I wanna see it, but I think it's gonna take longer than that. I mean, how it took 500 years to make us this way. How long is it going to take us to undo it? Take pride in who you, who you are, where you're from. Take pride in your culture. It might be challenging, but once you get through, I think, uh, I think everything will be OK in the end. It'll take time. You know, I probably won't be here forever, but <laughs> I'm hoping, really hoping that Things will be much better for my grandchildren and great-grandchildren and the people here that are just coming up. I was just talking about that to my grandson this morning. I said, hey, hey son, what do you want in, in, in the future? 
What do you think you're going to do? And then he started talking about what he wanted to do. And then I said, well, how are you going to make it happen? What are you going to do to make it happen? Because I said, you're the only one that determines what your life is going to be. And I said, that's what we want, why we went to treat it. We want to be the ones who determine what our life is going to be. You have that this chance you know, to make this treaty even better than what it is today. You're going to make it better tomorrow than it is for me today. That's a darn good place to be. You know, many people seem concerned about the future generations. I'm excited for them because I think we're starting to get it right. There's limits to growth. There's the myth of unlimited abundance is over. Now we've got to manage and steward and sustain what we have. And that takes all of us. It's just been the last two or three or four years that we've started to see a shift. We know the impacts of residential school, generations of effects. I imagine it'll take generations to fix some of what's gone on, but the first thing we gotta do is acknowledge it, and we're getting it. I'm so hopeful and so happy to, all of this shift, this paradigm shift in reconciliation and understanding has allowed me to move past my working years and uh, with a lot of hope and, and trust in the future and that our future generations will be fine. I know Matthew Jack has uh, gone to our school in Cayucet and, and has given presentations and told them that one day that they will be here. He put that thought in their head that, you know, you could do this. Been doing it since, since I was 19. A couple more years, I'll be 50. So as I've been doing it for a long time, so that, that's the big fight, is to ensure safety for, for all of our generations to come. Someday, you guys will be our leaders. So now we're, we gotta pass all this down to, down to you guys, and then, you know, all the other younger generations. So it'd be awesome to see you guys and take on the roles that we're doing, and, you know, never, never ever be afraid to help your people. It's, it's, it's an honor to, to be able to do so. You know, it's, it's been my honor. I love it, that's why I do it. You know, so thank you guys for the honor.